Dr. Graham Moffat, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm always interested in talking to psychology and uh, neuroscience and mental health professionals who are really interested in sort of where the cutting edge of technology in our space is going. That is exactly what I'm interested in. I've even titled the, this episode something about the cutting edge of uh, of uh, neurotechnology, something like that. I don't even remember the title. I don't have it in front of me. But uh, I'm really excited to speak to you because uh, I did interview Ariel Garten, the founder of, uh, of Muse, the Muse uh, brain scanning headband and uh, have been using one, it was about a year ago that I interviewed her, and I've used it not as consistently as I would hope, uh, but I've used it, uh, I've had some good long runs <laughs> with it. And that's we, that's we, great. <laughs> that's that the, um, one of the most interesting things we've learned is that, um, you know, technology, um, most people who are in, interested in technology for mindfulness or for mental health uh, don't want that to become a crutch for them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who use Muse will use it for spurts uh, of, you know, weeks or months, and then they'll drop off and then they'll come back. Um, and I think it's part of the, part of it, part of the benefit is from reestablishing habits, you know, no matter how, um, how, how good you are at, at um, establishing healthy practices, uh, getting a sort of a booster shot or reinvigoration of your habits is, is always helpful. And where technology can help, that's, uh, that's where it can benefit, I think, mental health the most. Yeah, yeah, good. And uh, we'll, talk, we'll be talking about uh, Muse more, and particularly the Muse 2, which has just recently come out. Uh, but be, I want to back up a bit before, before we get into that, because uh, you have had such a fascinating career and are a very interesting person to me, because I watched you and Ariel in a, uh, a recent TEDx presentation. And um, so tell us a little bit about your background, just kind of the, you know, not too much time, but uh, yeah, to give us a little bit of your background before you came to Muse. Happy to. Um, so yeah, I'm the chief scientist here at, uh, at Interaxon, the company that makes Muse. Uh, and uh, I came to this uh, to a degree, I wouldn't say by accident, but I came to it from a, a, a unique path that I haven't heard a lot of people um, getting into neurofeedback, biofeedback, this kind of neurotechnology, and specifically mindfully focused neurotechnology. So um, my background is uh, I was a, a, I trained as a physicist in undergraduate uh, in, a, in my, my first university degree, uh, went on to do experimental psychophysics uh, with Larry Roberts and Laurel Trainer at McMaster University and. Uh, I think one of the best, better auditory uh, perception and neuroplasticity labs in the world. Uh, uh, and uh, then moved on to animal physiology, looking for treatments for um, neuroplasticity gone wrong, I guess you'd say, in, in, the, in the cortex. So there are a number of ways in which, you know, we tend to think of neuroplasticity, um, in the popular sense at least, uh, as something that's beneficial. It helps you recover from injury. It helps your brain stay young. But um, neuroplasticity really in its purest uh, sense it just means you know the changing and the plasticity of the brain, and that can go um, in some interesting ways. Uh, one of the most famous ways that it can go wrong is um, Ramachandran's example of phantom limb pain. So you know there are these parts of the brain that are attuned to parts of the body, and when uh, when someone loses a limb or a body part, um, they can feel this sensation of pain associated with the body part, even though the body part is absent. That's right. that's a form of neuroplasticity um, that's I guess you'd say maladaptive. Um, and my early work in uh, grad school and beyond was on uh, tinnitus and looking for looking at what happened in the in the, the cortex of mammals um, after a traumatic noise injury or uh, hearing loss. And so moved from there into uh, working in scientific communication, where I ran Frontiers in Neuroscience, which I think is still the largest or second largest open access journal series in the field of neuroscience. Um, from there, uh, moved into AI and some machine learning stuff. And um, when I when I'd been running Frontiers in Neuroscience, a funny thing happened. I uh, it was right around the time that mindfulness and the, the neuroscience of mindfulness really seeped into the mainstream of uh, neuroscience. So for a yeah. long time, I think it had been on the fringes. And the work of Richie Davidson and Sarah Lazar and Judd Brewer and uh, some of these you know well-known personalities of uh, the neuroscience of mindfulness. 
uh, really sort of broke through into the scientific main, the neuroscience mainstream. Uh, we published a special issue at uh, Frontiers in Neuroscience that was edited by Amishi Jha and some colleagues. Um, and Amishi is also quite a well-known uh, neuroscience researcher who uh, does extensive work on, on attention and mindfulness. Uh, and I was reading all these papers thinking, boy, I, I had better be practicing meditation because this, this seems to be almost too good to be true. You know, this is, uh, this is really, really beneficial for brain health. And... Uh, yeah. So I, I really struggled to figure out how to do that because this was in the days before, this is about 2011, this is in the days before Headspace, this is in the days before there were all kinds of meditation guides on YouTube. Um, and when you're living in a relatively small and remote part of the world, uh, there's not a lot of meditation teachers around. So when I encountered the group at, uh, at Interact on Ari and Chris and the founders uh, and had the opportunity to come and work here on something that married uh, you know, this, this fascination I had with mindfulness and meditation uh, with the sort of technical skill that I had developed as a neuroscientist, I jumped at the chance. And, um, and I've been here for four and a half years working on um, not just the, the neuroscience of mindfulness and meditation with Muse, but how we can sort of push the envelope of what electroencephalography and what this technology can do in a variety of applications uh, outside of the laboratory and in the real world. Yeah, uh, I think you'll understand how uh, fascinating and exciting this is for me because in way back in 1970, I did my doctoral dissertation on the role of attention in meditation and hypnosis. I had no tools to measure the brain, yeah. so I asked people to click a, a clicker every time they had to bring their attention back from following their breath or, or staring at a candle. So, and that <laughs> think, you know that that's have moved it, forward. Yeah. Amazingly, since then, they, they haven't. To a degree, they haven't. Um, you know, one of the things you'll notice is if you go and look at the literature on uh, on neuroscience of mindfulness, some of the the tasks that are used for the measurement of mind wandering and attention are still very much uh, those kinds of self reported either clicker or a button. Uh, there are some clever new uh, permutations of those classic experiments and classic paradigms. Uh, using some more readily available technology that, you know, it's m more easily accessible now, I'd say. Uh, you can do this outside of a laboratory. You can do this in, you know, you can do this remotely on people's smartphones. Yeah. The, the I may have are still those. And it's, I, may, I may have originated the clicker. <laughs> and it, it's still what, it's still a, that paradigm is still used today. The, um, the self-caught uh, mind-wandering uh, paradigm. Is, yeah, wow. is still widely used in, uh, in attention and mindfulness research. That's um, and the same, the same is true, uh, interestingly, of, of EEG and neurofeedback. Uh, one way to think of Muse is that as, as a neurofeedback or a biofeedback-assisted um, meditation learning tool. Uh, it, among other things, it, you know, it could be construed as that. Um, and the, the fascinating part about neurofeedback and biofeedback is that it, was, it became popular in the late 60s, early 70s, even maybe into the 80s a little bit. Uh, but then there was a collapse in, in the in, in research interest in the field due in part to the overselling of the promise and the potential benefits and in part due to some controversies around the, the robustness of the, uh, of the findings. Uh, and it, it really sort of waned until the 90s when it came back starting in Germany and then later in the US and, and elsewhere. Uh, and then Wayne and EEG kind of waxed and waned along with that um, for a variety of reasons. You know, the high we went from 20 channel systems to 64 to 128 channel systems. Uh, and then we got to uh, precise time lock stimulus presentation where we could do different paradigms with that. And then we got much more, much more powerful computers and more powerful statistical techniques for looking at uh, where in the brain these electrical sources were uh, originated. And then we moved on to analyzing how networks of different sources um, interacted and came up with models for that based on uh, you know, other parts of the, the, uh, the field of neuroscience. Uh, so bringing what we knew about neuros what we've known about neuroscience now for you know, some number of decades into the field of EEG has really potentiated uh, a wide variety of new uses for the technology. And I'd say that uh, there, there's a researcher I, uh, I really admire, Brad Wojtek at the University of California, San Diego, uh, who set a, as one of his goals in the last few years to revivify the field of EEG research. And, and I think it's really succeeded. There's, there's a real interest now in a very wide community of researchers in using EEG for things that 
um, things that it classically could be used for, but also using new techniques of an analysis to look deeper into the signals and, and pull out some more insights. Wow, I wasn't aware of any of that, uh, that, that biofeedback had kind of ha gone out of fashion for a while and is now being reborn. I, I think we're on the third, we're on the third wave of biofeedback now, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, fascinating. So yeah. that kind of leads into another thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, enabling technologies. Like clearly there, you've been talking about some of the technologies that have enabled what's now the state of art of the art to today in terms of brain training and, and so on. And I'm wondering if there are technologies on the horizon that you see or are hoping for that might move the ball even further. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, the big thing that has potentiated a lot of what, uh, a lot of what, what's really advancing things, um, uh, at least in terms of the research side, is um, open science and open source software. So uh, that's really blown the doors open on uh, what people can do, the kind of software tools they can access. You know, a lot of things are free now that used to be very costly. Uh, electroencephalography has come down in price from, you know, you, it would have cost you fifty or hundred thousand um, dollars to get any system twenty years ago, uh, to where now you can get a Muse for. 200, 249, something like that, uh, depending yeah. on where you are and what model you get. Um, and that is due in part to um, the proliferation of the supercomputers we carry around in our pockets that we call yeah. smartphones. Yeah. <laughs> Not, yeah. For, for, for two more principal reasons. More powerful computers than they had when they sent people to the moon. <laughs> that's right. And that's mind blowing. That, it, it is amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, it, when you think about what we use these things for and how powerful the computers are, uh, it seems it sometimes seems a bit ridiculous. Uh, but the two um, the two big things that that were potentiated by the arrival of the smartphone were um, that it it uh, enabled the remote and portable processing of very complex data sets uh, like e like electroencephalography uh, in real time to a degree as well, so that you could create experiences on that basis that would be portable uh, biofeedback and neurofeedback. Um, yeah. And not just that, but you could use the way that we have designed games and, uh, and interactions on uh, smartphones to, uh, to really improve the experience in such a way that it's compelling and easy to use for, for anyone. And the other is that just the proliferation of smartphone technology has created these enormous supply chains of very low cost electronic components, which is one of the reasons why we were able to build uh, Muse for at, in volume for hundreds of dollars instead of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, uh, it's remarkable it's, it, that as, as I can remember that uh, biofeedback devices, because I was interested in biofeedback as well, um, you know, in the early days of biofeedback, and it would cost a lot of money, thousands of dollars to get any kind of a biofeedback device. Yeah, yeah. And now under two hundred dollars. Um, That's right, and that and that'll open. keep dropping. I think it'll um, you know mm -hmm. it'll steadily de decrease in price as um, the technology becomes uh, cheaper and better. Uh, so you know, in ten years, we might see an EEG system for tens of dollars. Uh, yeah, that's, wow. I think that's entirely yeah. that's an entirely conceivable um, like a, a good EEG system that might cost you fifty bucks or less. Uh, yeah. Now, so that. Going Sorry, back go to enabling technologies, uh, what about virtual reality, augmented reality? Do you see that as being? Yeah, and you you um, you would know probably better than I do about the applications, the wide range of applications for uh, virtual and augmented reality in um, therapy, um, in psych really psychotherapy. I don't, I don't um, think I. Do. <laughs> there's quite a. I think we're still in the early days. Uh, but there's now a dedicated field of, of medicine and of mental health um, that's looking very hard at uh, what we can use virtual reality for uh, effectively in uh, improving patients' quality of life, whether they're in hospital, in the ICU, or something like that, or um, you know, in long-term care, or um, remote uh, administration of exposure therapy uh, in virtual reality. Uh, one of the things that's neat about, about these systems is that they're, they're still pretty bulky. They're, hopefully they'll get smaller in the future, but they're still pretty bulky right now. And that means that 
there's a lot of um, stuff going on around the head. You have to wrap this thing on. Yeah. Uh, and that means that you have all of these contact points on the head where you can put biosensors um, like EEG or, or functional near infrared spectroscopy or galvanic skin response or any number of things. And incorporating uh, real time biosignals into virtual reality uh, for you know, neuroadaptive interfaces. Uh, interfaces that you can imagine, for example, would dial up or down uh, the intensity of an experience or the attentional load uh, experienced by a user uh, on the basis of whether what they were able to attend to and what their uh, what the evoked responses uh, in these biosignals showed us about what they were attending to and what they were experiencing. So, I think there's real potential here for some very compelling uh, experiences in virtual and augmented reality uh, that are driven by real-time, um, what they call neuroadaptive interfaces. So rather than a direct, you know, you're trying to control an object by thinking, uh, this is something that sits in the background and just adapts the interface and adapts the software or the game or the experience or whatever it is to keep it at a level that is engaging but not overwhelming. Uh, and then you can, you can adjust that accordingly. You're, uh, you're reminding think, me, actually, I said I didn't know anything about that, but you're reminding me that I interviewed uh, Skip... Um, Rizzo, Skip Rizzo, yeah, yeah, of USC, who uh, was an early user of this kind of technology for uh, soldiers. Absolutely, he's he's one of the pioneers in this field, and still to yeah. this day is is one of the leaders. And um, there are others like Walter Greenleaf at Stanford and uh, Brennan Spiegel at uh, uh, I think he's at Cedar Sinai. There are there are a bunch of people now who are doing really good work that have uh, they have they host a conference at Cedar Sinai every year that's just a fantastic uh, sort of world leading thing uh, for the development and testing and deployment and best practices around uh, the use of virtual reality in medicine and healthcare. Yeah, and um, another sort of related area uh, is and that you refer to uh, in your TEDx presentation was learning to use thought control to control physical devices uh, and yeah what, what's what's at the really cutting edge right now um, that's a really interesting one because a lot of people had sort of been hoping that uh, we would have a non-invasive way of using electroencephalography or some wearable head-worn system to be able to control um, a software interface or a machine uh, just by thinking something and it turns out that it's it's probably going to be possible to do that non-invasively. Certainly it's possible to do it with, um, with you know, surgically implanted invasive electrodes, uh, but that's a, that's a very limited case. Uh, it turns out it is possible to do this, but probably not with EEG in the way that people had hoped. Uh, the way that, that this seems to really be the most promising application for, for active brain computer interfaces and brain controlled software uh, is using electro uh, biography. So muscle activity in the forearm. If you put a, 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 a bunch of electrodes around the forearm, almost like a, like a wristband, uh, you can use machine learning and uh, you can use the neuroplasticity uh, as people learn how to interact with this interface to get uh, very, very high fidelity control over hands and uh, limbs and virtual reality. You can even, uh, you know, with training, you can add, add fingers to someone's interface so they can be typing with eight fingers on each hand uh, after a, a, some amount of practice uh, in, a virtual, in a virtual setting. Uh, and the way that this is done is by, yeah. Eight fingers? So, yeah, there's a, there's a really great, there's a great company in, in New York, uh, Control Labs, that does this. And what they do is uh, they measure uh, impulses and the muscles in the forearm. And, and you, can, uh, you can learn through practice and through training with this interface to control uh, single motor units in the forearm. So very, very fine control. And that allows you to have uh, a degree of control in software without moving your hand that uh, you know, gives you a complete control of a virtual or a hand in a virtual space. Uh, wow. And then you can extend from there to a hand that has more digits <laughs> than your own because you can control, you know, you have this degree of control uh, in virtual space. So. Uh, it really is a fascinating field of research just for not, not only for, um, for virtual reality and for brain computer interfaces, but also as a, as a model for understanding motor learning and neuroplasticity. Wow. In your presentation, your TEDx presentation, you mentioned that uh, Elon Musk has moved into this space 
creating a division or a company called Neuralink. Uh, what can you tell us about what he's up to? What does he hope to achieve? I wish I could, t I wish I could tell you what they're up to. Uh, you know, you, you hear only rumors about what goes on in, uh, inside Neuralink and um, some of these well-financed, uh, we'll, we'll call them, I guess, um, companies or neurotechnology research and development shops, uh, they, they're a really genuinely positive development for the field, I think for mental health and I think for um, neuro rehabilitation and, uh, and a variety of different applications. These are, this is, it's a really, really good thing that Facebook and Elon Musk and Brian Johnson are uh, digging into you know, the brain as a, as a potential technology interface and trying to, trying to really pour resources at solving problems in a focused way that, that is very often difficult to do for publicly funded research. So, uh, you know, not, not very much gets out from, uh, from what uh, Neuralink and some of these places are up to, but it's going to, be, uh, it's going to be exciting to see when they finally decide to reveal what they've been working on, uh, just how far they've gotten. You know, some wow. of the best scientists yeah. in the world are working now with resources, um, levels of funding that uh, I think were unavailable or, or are unavailable to, to most neuroscientists out there working in publicly funded and academic institutions. Well, this raises the question in my mind about uh, the quotes, the singularity, the idea that uh, this technology, that computers will eventually outpace us cognitively and then maybe take over. Do you, I mean, you, you've mastered more of this technology or more of an insider than anybody else I've spoken to. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I don't know if I'm that much of an insider compared to some of the, the AI scientists out there who, um, you know, are, are neck deep in, uh, in uh, AI research. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's as much, uh, I think it's a, it's a question for, for cognitive science as to, you know, how thinking works and do, are, are, do computers, are computers going to have the same kind of cognition or a comparable cognition to the way that humans think? there's not particularly any reason to believe that they will. Uh, so it could be a completely different kind of thinking than what we even imagine to be thinking or reasoning. Um, the, to a degree, what we've mostly done with artificial intelligence to date has been to do, uh, you know, human tasks, try to get computers to do human like tasks at, at a human like level of performance. So whether it's speech comprehension or object recognition in a, an image or, those kinds of things. And we're pretty impressed by those, but um, where it starts to get even more interesting is uh, when you get these, uh, these AIs learning very complex games and very complex um, strategy system. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating field. Um, where it becomes, where I am not necessarily, I think on the same page as a lot of um, enthusiasts of the singularity will say, is I think we have a very long way to go uh, before we can interface with the, the human brain in a way that allows us to com communicate meaningfully with computers via, uh, let's say, a, a, a neurobiological interface to, or neuro an electronic interface to, uh, to a brain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, <clears throat> there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot going on in the human brain. And um, just tapping in, even even ten thousand electrodes in a in in a brain is is going to capture a very small part of of uh, the information processing that's happening in that brain. Right. So right. there's well, um, think... Christoph Christoph Koch from the Allen Institute likes to say that you know the the roundworm C. elegans has or I guess the flatworm has uh, uh, three hundred and two neurons and we still don't really know how this thing works and the human brain has. Uh, billions of neurons, tens of billions of neurons, and we're probably a very long way from from really getting a grasp. So I think uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm, and that's great, but I'm not so sure that in our lifetimes we're going to see a full comprehensive understanding of how the human brain works. Okay. Now, you've done a lot of research uh, on the use of uh, this brain technology in uh, with meditation. And so what's yeah. the evidence that neurotech can help with, <clears throat> with meditation? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think I should, um, there's a caveat here that um, uh, I think a lot of people uh, who look at Muse will say, well, I don't need this in order to meditate. Why would I need technology in order to meditate? And if that's true for you, then that's, 
that's absolutely correct. Um, if you can med if you already know how to meditate and you have a healthy meditation practice that you're happy with, you don't need a muse. Um, mm -hmm. If you if you find uh, you know if you if you find technology interesting and you want to try a new experience uh, and maybe get new insight, then it, it could be for you. The technology is really designed uh, principally for beginners who have who really struggle. As you know, based on your doctoral research, people really don't know when their mind is wandering uh, unless they're experienced meditators. And that's one of the reasons why meditators are so fascinating to cognitive scientists and cognitive neuroscientists is they have this a level of or a degree of control over mind wandering and a metacognition, a meta awareness of, of um, their cognitive processes that um, few other people do. So someone who has that kind of powerful control over cognition is a fascinating subject for uh, cognitive science. Um, the, uh, the beginner, in contrast to, um, to an expert meditator, will tend to not recognize that their mind has wandered for minutes um, or even tens of minutes um, after they've gone into a, uh, either a ruminative or a daydreaming kind of process. Uh, and so what, they, what we've designed Muse to do and it was quite by accident that we got here, but um, we, uh, what we've designed Muse to do now is, is to help people recognize mind wandering and to train them to recognize it themselves uh, through auditory feedback with, uh, based on their electroencephalogram. So you pop this thing on your head and it sends, a, it sends signals to your smartphone uh, and the EEG is processed on the smartphone it's turned into a soundscape, so a virtual auditory soundscape, and that may be a city park, it may be a rainforest, it may be a beach, you can choose whatever you like. And there are instruction sets as well that go along with this to teach uh, different meditation practices. Uh, so from that, you, you get these cues when your mind wanders away from uh, a focused state to bring your attention back to your breath or to bring your attention back to your sensation of breath or <coughs> excuse me, whatever it is you've chosen to focus on. So that really is the core value of the technology. And that takes quite a lot of practice for most people to get. Say it's really such a leap beyond, <clears throat> uh, beyond my doctoral research that I referred to earlier because it was confounded by just what you're pointing out that not everybody <coughs> is going to be terribly Sorry. sensitive to when their mind wanders. And they may be off for some time on a journey before they kind of remember, oh, I'm supposed to press a button now, I guess. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. They, um, and quite ex you know, experienced meditators will, will do that right away. You'll get more button presses from them. And they have more control over when they let their minds work. Uh -huh. So really just getting beginners to, have to establish this practice and recognize when their mind is wandered this is a core part of the technology behind Muse. Now, Muse 2 has a few more features beyond that, but that's really what the, um, the electroencephalography part of, of Muse was designed to do. And the reason we got to that, um, and this is, a, this is a kind of a funny story, but um, we were actually trying to build uh, something different. So the founders of the company were trying to build a, a way of controlling, as we discussed earlier, a way of controlling a computer interface by thinking about <clears throat> you know, one thing or another. So uh, the original goal was, to, to move a mouse cursor in an augmented reality interface. And what the, the founders discovered when they were trying to learn how to control this thing is, you know, if, you, if you're trying to learn any, any kind of controlled complex task, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. When you're trying yeah, so to learn maybe, any kind of you know, With just my mind, I would be able to think copy and then paste. And, and <coughs> or move left and move right. Yeah, and move yeah. the cursor over to here, you know, copy here and <coughs> There. And it's, it's very difficult to make that technology work. But what you can do by accident when you're trying to make it work is learn how to meditate. So <laughs> meditators are much better, experienced meditators are much better at controlling brain computer interfaces than non-meditators. Okay. And even people who've been through an MBSR course will be much better at controlling brain computer interfaces than novices. So this is, a, this is a finding now that's been replicated a couple of times, and this is what we discovered by accident is in trying to build this tool for controlling a computer, we had accidentally taught ourselves meditation. Wow. <laughs> that, uh, I had, <clears throat> yeah. had heard that story when I interviewed Ariel. She didn't mention that. <laughs> yeah. That's, 
I think I think Ariel likes the story of having us having done this quite intentionally. Um, yeah. And that was what that was that was where Ariel's story picks up is when uh, the team realized that they had a tool that was not in fact what it was designed to do, but it was a, an excellent way of teaching meditation or learning meditation by trying to to use this tool. That became the, the sort of aha moment yeah. where it was uh, there was a realization. Wait a minute, we we haven't built what we thought we were building, but we've built something that's potentially much more useful. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. What what do you call this field that we're talking about? Do you call it psych tech or? Uh, know, we call it neurotechnology. Neurotechnology. Okay. Yeah. And there may be a leap between, you know, I'm thinking about the spiritual journey and, you know, is I hear that you're not claiming th that the, spiritual journey is necessarily enhanced electronically i don't yeah i don't think that the spiritual journey is necessarily enhanced i think part of the parts of this that are cognitive and attentional are definitely enhanced the parts that are have to do with establishing some of the basic cognitive skills required for uh to enable that spiritual journey for people who are seeking that uh, is uh th this can be a very helpful technology some of the the research that we've done suggests that not only do we get this, you know, similar outcomes to, say, um, at least psychometric outcomes to a mindfulness-based stress reduction course or to a meditation retreat, uh, but we see those in within, you know, about four weeks of starting. If you muse every day for 15 or 20 minutes, <clears throat> we start to see some neuroplastic effects and some self-reported um, psychometric effects, uh, similar to what meditators report or novice meditators report in a course or in a retreat. Uh, we see those with home practice after uh, after about four weeks. So wow. it, you know, the, yeah. The, yeah, the skills, the, and then of course they continue to improve. And the other things that we see are augmentations of uh, certain uh, components of the EEG. Uh, so there's a, a one way of analyzing EEG is to time lock to stimulus events, and then play the same stimulus uh, pretty repeatedly, and every so often throw in an oddball stimulus, and the oddball prompts your attentional mechanisms to kick in and say, wait a minute, something's different there. Uh, so you can give somebody a task or you can just play a passive oddball um, stimulus, whether it's visual or auditory. And you see these components that respond specifically to that oddball. Uh, when you look at those in people who've used Muse for say four weeks, there's an augmentation of some of the cognitive elements of that, of the P3 response. So about 300 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. And that suggests to us that uh, the attentional resources of these people have been more, uh, have been, I guess, refined, you'd say. Uh, I have to choose my, choose my words carefully here. Uh, there's a neuroplastic effect uh, that seems to suggest that there's an augmentation of the ability to notice change, uh, which suggests that there's a change in the performance of attention in some of these tasks. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, going back again to my doctoral uh, work, I really think that attention is such a key concept uh, to lots of phenomena. So it's great that, now one of the magical things is because of the success of Muse and having sold lots of the devices, uh, you're able to get very large data sets now, both for people who are interested in studying the effects of, of uh, that kind of feedback on neuroplasticity <coughs> and as well as on Wait. meditation, and uh, yeah, and also that's um, that's uh, one of the really really encouraging things about yeah. this is that we are able to get, uh, <clears throat> I think, probably unprecedented scale in um, neuro data, electroencephalography data, uh, and this will this will be true of other modalities of measuring the brain at some point as well. Um, we, because we have so many people out there using Muse who we ask them to share their data with us for research purposes, about you know, two thirds of them will say yes. Because a lot of these people who have adopted Muse in their practice are interested in technology and interested in the, the, the science of the brain. <clears throat> so when we, when we look into these data, what we see is an enormous sample of people from you know, age about 16 to 92. Well, that's a sample of, uh, of uh, granularity that's never been seen before in electroencephalography. So we can see things that 
other scientists have reported on in really great detail. And we can look into components uh, of attention. We can look into components that are related to age, gender. Uh, and we see these differences because of the enormous statistical power that pop falls out of a data set of you know, hundreds of thousands of people and millions and millions of, of sessions of EEG. So we're very, very fortunate that our users are enthusiastic about this and that they, they share their data with us. And we've done some great collaborations with the University of California, San Diego, with McMaster University, with the University of Toronto, and some other world-class universities on analyzing and digging into these and, and, and looking for uh, you know, new findings and, and new elements of EEG that uh, maybe hadn't been reported on before that allow us to make the make views more powerful, but also generate some insights that are really useful for uh, brain health research. Yeah, it reminds me of Apple Computer and the health research that they're now <laughs> able to do because uh, so many people like myself have an Apple Watch. And, uh, and uh, so that's an exciting area and you're playing in a similar space. It, it really is exciting. We're, um, we're very fortunate to be here. Uh, and we're, we, you know, we have some, we have some great collaborators from around the world who are really excited about this. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that the, in the, the maybe medium to long term, what we'll see fall out of this is, is new measures of brain health that will allow us to intervene earlier. One of the things, one of the big challenges in maintaining brain health as you age is detecting problems early, early enough so that you can intervene. Uh -huh. So if we can do a little bit better at that and get people on the right track early enough, detect problems and help them optimize their brain health. So even, you know, going beyond just thinking about it in terms of health and illness, if we can help people to optimize their brain health or performance at whatever it is that they want to be best at, that's really a positive potential outcome of using data at this scale and using technology at this scale. And I, I think it's, I think it's not far off. I wonder if this, could perhaps be an, an early warning system for people with dementia or Alzheimer's that would end, you know, kind of be the canary in the mind, so to speak. Yeah, that's, uh, we, we actually have a couple projects on that right now. So we're working with um, one of the big um, hospitals for uh, elderly patients up here in Toronto, where we're based. Uh, Baycrest Hospital is one of the world leaders in, in neurodegenerative disease research. So we've got a fantastic collaboration up there with uh, the memory clinic, and they're going to be using Muse um, to test people on their, uh, on their first visit to the memory clinic and then some number of weeks or months later. Uh, and they'll be trying different interventions, behavioral and lifestyle interventions, and seeing if we can detect changes with using just a, a home-based EEG tool like Muse. Yeah. So I think it yeah. really, that, that's a really promising um, avenue of research. And, you know, hopefully we'll get there. Yeah, I can see where it could be both diagnostic, but also provide some kind of remediation or treatment by presenting the person yeah. with tests, uh, to keep them sharp, if you will. Yeah, I mean, mindfulness is a great way to keep your brain young. Um, yeah. You know, meditation practices, uh, the, the literature on this, the scientific literature is, is very strong, I think, uh, in, at least in the, uh, to the extent that it suggests that uh, the brains of meditators, long-term meditators, look anatomically and functionally younger than, than non-meditators. That's uh, very, very encouraging to me to hear that. Were you a meditator before you got involved with Muse? Um, I was a failed meditator. And okay. I, I think I'm not a failed meditator anymore. Uh -huh. I, although, I, although I suppose, you know, if you really think about it and you get philosophical, there's there's no, there's no threshold for success. So I suppose I'm still probably a failed meditator. Um, maybe a little less failed than before. Uh-huh. Okay. And um, another thing that I've been very interested in, because I'm also interested in what's being called the third wave of psychedelic research. And um, I don't know if you are following that at all or not, but there's speculation about the relationship between the default network of the brain and some of the experiences that people have under the influence of LSD or other psychedelics. Um, have you looked into that at all? Thinking about that, um, I'm not. I'm not up to speed on the uh, on the, the sort of bleeding edge of it. Uh, I have read some interesting papers. I think it's uh, you know when you see the to, to my mind the the efficacy of of some of these psychedelics in uh, mental health 
now that we're back in the, as you say, the third wave of this, uh, yeah. is uh, so remarkable that it's, uh, it's, it's hard not to look back on all of these lost years and say, my goodness, we could have been doing so much. Yeah. Uh, but at yeah. least we're at least we're here now. Um, right. And, you know, one of the things that we uh, there, there are there are some really, really interesting papers coming out of mainstream neuroscience research labs looking at uh, psychedelics like ayahuasca and LSD and um, and even some things, you know, beyond the sort of MDMA LSD mainstream in, in, uh, in, in psychedelics, uh, mental health research uh, that are very encouraging and promising. And it's. Uh, you know, we've had, we've had so little success in drugs to treat and improve the central nervous system, uh, particularly psychiatric drugs for, for so many decades that to finally have this new class of, um, or this, this old new, um, category of, of yeah. potential treatments is, or therapeutics is, is really promising. Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. I think, um, yeah. what else did I want to ask you here? I'm, I think we've touched on I think, uh, why don't you uh, share with our audience uh, what Muse 2 brings to the party beyond Muse 1? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, we added, uh, we noticed a couple of things when we went in to do some of this uh, research that I talked about with Muse 1. Uh, and one of the things we noticed was that uh, we seem to be seeing a signal in the, uh, in the accelerometer sensor, the movement sensor in the Muse, that looked like a heartbeat. So <clears throat> it turned out we could actually pick up uh, people's heartbeats from the, the movement of their head, um, even while they sat quite, you know, in a, in a tranquil uh, meditative position. Mm -hmm. uh, so what that encouraged us to do was to go and look at what we could do with these kinds of sig bio signals that we were pulling out by accident or that were uh, byproducts of some of the sensors that we had built into the original Muse. Uh, and that led us into looking at, Bi more, more classical forms of biofeedback, uh, looking at the heart, looking at breathing. So we can use, now we have a, a cardiac sensor called a photoplethysmograph, which is the same thing that's on your Apple Watch. It shines a light and it sees the, the uh, mechanical flow of blood past the, the or through the arteries in, in your systemic circulation. Um, so it's right up here on the forehead next to the, the electroencephalography sensors, the EEG sensors on the Muse. Uh, and it picks up blood flow and we can see in real time blood flow. So we can actually play someone's heartbeat back to them uh, oh. as a form of biofeedback. Yeah. <clears throat> now the interesting thing about playing someone's heartbeat back to them is that there's a, there's a literature out there, a scientific literature that says that people who are better able to perceive their, their internal sensations, what we call interoception. Uh, so perception of the interior of the body interoception mm -hmm. um, are, uh, have different, personality characteristics. They have a higher degree of empathy. They um, have a different kind of emotional reactivity. Uh, I don't know how robust that some of those results are, but uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was to give our users the opportunity to experiment with um, listening to the sounds of their own body, their heartbeat, their breathing, and giving them forms of biofeedback, sort of uh, a mix between classical and experimental <clears throat> that would allow them to breathe in phase uh, and to listen to their heartbeats and to, you know, use uh, breathing to accelerate and decelerate their heartbeats, uh, which is called the sinus arrhythmia, and move the soundscape around in a, in a compelling way. So the hope is that <clears throat> this is going to help people who are using Muse to get in touch with their bodies a little bit better and, um, you know, maybe improve their relationship with their body and listen to what it's trying to tell them uh, by listening to the processes, the physiological processes that go on in the background all of the time. Now, are uh, you, are you a, aware of a, of a group called Heart Math? Yes, yeah. Yeah, and, th and they've done a lot of research. And, they've done uh, some really interesting things with uh, heart rate variability biofeedback, yeah. Right. And yeah. so uh, does your device, does Muse2 measure heart rate variability? Uh, we can, so not in real time. Uh, we are working on some experimental features in the hopes that we'll be able to roll some of those out. Uh, not necessarily real-time heart rate variability, but maybe scoring it. It's, it's a little bit more difficult to measure heart rate variability with, uh, with the light-based sensor, like the one on the Apple Watch, the, the PPG, um, mm -hmm. than it is with an ECG. So an ECG is, uh, they actually have those on the Apple Watch now too, but uh, ECG is the electrical heart signal. Uh, and it's much more precise uh, in terms of the timing of the, 
uh, the event of the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a, a better signal to noise ratio and an easier to measure and easier to build an experience on that. So these are all things that we're thinking about for future muses. Um, and we're also working on uh, developing from the data that, that our users share with us some new tools to give back to them uh, to, to augment the experience. Yeah, there's another company that I'm doing some, some uh, work with that is using a heart rate, you know, a chest band to measure yep. heart rate stuff. And, and yeah, there are, there are a number of different ways of measuring it. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that, one of the, the most recent tools that I really like is um, there's a ring made by a, a Finnish company, Ura, O-U-R-A, uh, and it measures heart rate variability overnight as you sleep uh, on the, the uh, arterial blood flow on your finger, because it's just a very relatively small ring. Uh, and it uses that information to then prompt you to change your daytime behavior to improve your sleep. So it's a really fascinating way of kind of nudging people toward better sleep. Huh. Yeah, I I need to look into that more. I, I was aware of it. I've been to uh, a kind of an event where there were some representatives from the company, but I didn't spend enough time on that. Um, so you're using an accelerometer because the head kind of is pulsing. Well, we, we, uh, the Muse 1, we use the accelerometer. In Muse 2, we, use, uh, we actually put a uh, heart rate sensor in there. So we can, we can measure heart in real time with, uh, with a photoplethysmograph. So that's, oh, that's the same thing that's on the your, back of your Apple Watch, yeah. Yeah, that's what you said. Okay. Uh, is there anything that we haven't spoken about here? Well, I guess I, I would want you to underscore a little bit that there are two populations of people that are using Muse, as I understand it. One is are sort of regular people who are interested in meditation or... And then the other is um, there's, a, there's a great big group of people who are using Muse for um, neuroscience research. Uh, for re research, yeah, re research outside of the laboratory and neuroscience education at the undergraduate level. So, oh, really? well, yeah, the, you can do a lot other, of. The other group that I was thinking of was therapists, uh, psychotherapists, yes. who are using it as a biofeed biofeedback device to give to their uh, clients, patients, uh, to help them become more calm, to be aware of what's yeah. going on in the brain, et cetera. We, um, we discovered this, yeah, we discovered this with, um, uh, we'd, we'd spoken to a number of psychologists and psychotherapists who, uh, I think there was a real absence of ways of getting your patients involved in a mindfulness practice or helping them learn meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people were looking for a solution and Muse is one of the solutions that they found. Um, so there was a, there's quite a large population of clinicians and um, psychologists and psychotherapists, uh, psychiatrists even, who are uh, promoting the use of Muse to their patients. So they'll either loan it or you know, they will uh, they'll use it in, in uh, clinic. Uh, one of the things we've heard again and again is that if I get someone to do this in my waiting room, then they come in much more ready to um, mm -hmm. spend an hour or an hour and a half with me uh, in our session. Uh, so that was very encouraging. And we've, we've built some tools to support that for clinicians who are using Muse with multiple uh, different patients. So we have, we have done some support on that. And we have a, we have a professionals program that, uh, that tries to address some of the, the needs of, uh, of psychologists and psychotherapists. Yeah, so you've created a kind of community with two-way feedback. That they, <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, which uh, sounds like a wonderful development. And it sounds like this co your company is uh, is poised in such a way that uh, it may go take you to unexpected places, unexpected findings, and maybe other sorts of devices. Yeah, that's the um, that's the hope. Is we you know we uh, we've built a powerful technology that other people are using for for their own purposes, whether it's research or education or therapy, or for personal use. So um, <clears throat> the great thing about a technology platform like that is that you, you don't necessarily have to see where your where your users are going to take you. You can find out uh, by by the developments that the community leads you toward. So that's. Uh, that's a very promising and hopeful uh, development for us. And we're, uh, we're eagerly and, and uh, closely attuned to our, our, our users so that we can uh, you know, learn from them and, and continue to improve the technology for them. Yeah, great. 
Well, I wish I could pass this glass of water to you that I have here because I, I know this you've been uh, getting dry. Yeah, I, I should have brought a glass of water myself. <laughs> no. uh, is there anything else that you'd like to say as we begin to wrap things up? No, I think, um, I think we've covered a lot of ground here, and it's been a real pleasure to chat with you. So, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, I'd be happy to you know, come back in a year or two when, uh, when we have some new technology in the market and, and yeah. uh, talk about what we're hoping to do then. Yeah, I'll look forward to that. And I want to let people know that I do have an affiliate relationship with you guys such that my listeners can get a discount. So I'll talk about that more in, later on in this show. But uh, that aside, I just, I think this is so fascinating and important that I was eager to speak with you and not doing it to advertise the device particularly. That's just a byproduct of <laughs> what we're doing here. So I want to thank you. Oh, it's my uh, pleasure. Thank you.